And we looked next door, there was this old office building. And so we started talking with the owners and uh, long story short, ended up buying that office building and that site. And we combined them, brought them into the partnership with us. Oh, wow. And that created the five acres per Vantage. So episode 39 of the Deal Ranch podcast, CEO of the Spectrum Company, Steve McClure. Steve, thanks for having me in the office today. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Um, we were just chatting before we got started about the, the building we're in that you guys developed in, uh, the building across the street, which you converted to. So I think we'll talk about those later. But to give an overview of Spectrum, and I'll let you pick it up. So you guys develop, own, lease, manage quite a bit of property. So a portfolio of roughly 2 billion, maybe a little bit more. Um, I was reading online, I think somewhere near 6,000 multifamily units, 49 or 50 plus projects somewhere along the way there. Um, and then about two, 2 million in square footage owned, not including multifamily. Is that a good summation of the company? Yeah, no, I, I think okay. it's a good job. <laughs> okay. uh, through the years and uh, no, that, that that took into a lot. So yes. Uh, do you want to give a, a brief info, intro on yourself as CEO, but then also a, a better overview than that maybe of, of Spectrum too, and then we can kind of go back in time through your career and talk about some deals along the way? Uh, absolutely. Happy to. Uh, so yes, I've been at Spectrum for 20 years now. It's hard to believe. Yeah. Uh, and I'm CEO and I've uh, been in this role for the last couple of years. And obviously I uh, oversee uh, the company. I have a business partner, Daryl Dewberry, who's our chairman. Uh, who I've been with for the 20 years that I've been here. Uh, and so, yeah, oversee the team. We have an office here in Charlotte, uh, which we're sitting in, a large Raleigh, a large office in Raleigh, and we have a team member and an office down in Tampa as well. Uh, through the years, we've also had an office in Nashville. Uh, and so we've really Southeast focused. And so we, you know, different verticals we have. We have a large leasing and management team on the commercial side. Mm -hmm. So that's that's really just office mixed use. Uh, so that's a one main vertical. And then we have development, in which case uh, we both we do multifamily as well as mixed use. Uh, and then we also have a fund uh, capital management business where we have uh, we've done two funds currently and uh, we'll be preparing for a third fund. Um, so those are our three main verticals. Through the years, we've also had a, a construction services uh, group that we uh, spun off and uh, they were with us for a long time. But the leader, uh, it was a perfect time for him to take it on and um, and grow it. So it's a good transition. Um, so to build the story of Spectrum, the company started in 82 and I didn't get too much on that from, from research, but can you maybe blend your story from Wake Forest, kind of how you got into the, into working and then also what is the history of Spectrum, um, starting in the eighties? What was the foundation of the company? Yeah. Well, why don't we start there? Yeah. So uh, the company was founded in 1982, mm -hmm. uh, Jim Doolin and, uh, two other uh, gentlemen, uh, founded the company. And at the time, as an office developer, and at the time, one of the other founders, Bill McGuire, uh, also started Summit Properties, which was a multifamily group that eventually turns into Camden. Cool. Uh, and so, at the same, so he started both of those. But Jim Doolin uh, started it as an office developer, and you know, through the from '82 and the '80s, he was just out doing suburban uh, office developments. And then, as things sort of uh, got uh, a little more difficult uh, in our industry at the time. He really um, went into leasing and management to really focus on having that fee revenue. Mm. And so started growing the company um, in that category, both development of office and leasing and management. It really did that through the 80s and 90s. And then in 1995, uh, they bought out Bill McGuire, okay. one of the founders. Um, and there was a non-compete for five years to not get into multifamily. And so, because he had the summit, which is now Camden. And so after that five-year period, Spectrum moved into the multifamily business. Still by having the vertical and uh, on the commercial side, doing office and mixed use. And so our very first deal on the multifamily side, uh, I was not here, but we started out with uh, Fifth and Poplar, which was a uh, large urban deal uh, with a Harris Teeter in the base. Oh, wow. So nothing like starting with an easy project <laughs> uh, to get going. And so that was, you know, call it 2001. And uh, I joined in 2004. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, so let's step back then, sort of my progression from Wake Forest. So okay. I graduated in 2002. Uh, two months after I graduated, I uh, got married. Uh, met my go. met my bride at uh, Wake Forest, and uh, best decision um, I've ever been part of. Um, and so we we moved to Greenville, South Carolina, uh, right out of college. And I actually got into it was a tough time in 02 to seemed like an advertising job maybe it was I, I joined <laughs> Irwin Penland. Um, I was a media buyer, so I spent most of the time uh, on the phone negotiating um, buys for uh, different clients. So I enjoyed the negotiating uh, part of it, but I was in an office uh, all day and not out interacting more. So we knew I, I knew I wanted to do something different, and we also knew we wanted a little bit larger um, city. And so uh, my wife and I decided to move to Charlotte. Oh, cool! Um, and we did it. We, she was a teacher at the time, and so we she found a job, and we decided to come on up here without me having a job. And so we rented an apartment. And she was teaching for public schools here, and I was on the hunt for a job. And through different relationships, I, uh, my first job that I got here was uh, I joined a tenant rep firm. So I was an office tenant rep mm -hmm. broker, a uh, small firm, 100% commission, and a great learning experience uh, to learn the business. Uh, it was tough. Uh, spent a lot of time cold calling, and uh, but it was a you know just a it was a good challenge both. Uh, for myself, but also just on the family side, uh, learning to budget and live off of one uh, salary. And so so I did that for a year. And then uh, I knew, and I'd even shared with uh, you know, my employer at the time that I wanted to get in development long term. Mm -hmm. And I uh, called Spectrum, one of the brokers here uh, that I had been working on a deal with and said, hey, let's uh, get coffee. If you ever have an opportunity, I'd love to talk to you about it. So we met at Dean and DeLuca in Uptown Charlotte, back when Dean and DeLuca was here. And I uh, says, well, actually, we're looking right now. He picked up the phone. He called Daryl uh, Dewberry, my mm -hmm. business partner. And Daryl said, well, bring him over. So I left the coffee at Dean and DeLuca, drove over to Daryl's house, uh, went and sat on his couch, and had my first interview with Spectrum. And uh, the next, we followed that up with nine holes of golf. Was part of the process. Part of the interview, yeah. and uh, it it was great. I was you know, golf's. Uh, How'd you play? I actually, I played well. It was probably one of the most nervous I've been uh, playing golf, but uh, but I pretty competitive, and so mm -hmm. I wanted to play well, and uh, and it was great. And uh, you know, one of Daryl's advice as we we're finishing it, um, you know, he said you can be really successful in this business. You know, the biggest struggle you're going to have is being patient you know, letting things play out. You know, if, you know, you're going to be with us for a while, you're going to get phone calls to go other places um, and jump ship and try something new, uh, but be patient. And uh, I have, and it's uh, worked out uh, very well. You think it was sound advice looking back? It, it was. Yeah. You know, it's, it's easy to, uh, you know, go after the shiny object uh, at times and you know, I think it's more the norm uh, these days to not stay in one place for a long time. And it doesn't always work. You have to be with the right people um, and have the right mentors. And um, and I had that here. You know, both Jim Doolin, uh, one of the original founders, he was here, and Daryl uh, have been great. You know, helped me grow and gave me the opportunity to be in the position I am today. Uh, and I hope to continue to help others to have the same opportunities that I've had. That's awesome. What was the size, in, in this way we can tell the story of, of growth here because I have some questions tying to it. What was the size, maybe AUM, of where Spectrum was kind of when you came in? Like, do you know how big the portfolio was? So it, it was a different company then. What um, was it mainly focused so on? So it really was mainly on the commercial side, okay. the leasing and management. We, at the time oh, I wow. did, you know, it was mainly uh, commercial. We did have, we had done some condos mm -hmm. um, when, actually when I, it was more after I'd gotten here. Develop and sell? Uh, uh, develop and sell the okay. condos. Yeah. And that was really you know, in the 05, 06, uh, back when everyone was trying to do condos. Gold rush. Yes. Um, but we had a guy, uh, John Gray, who had joined Spectrum um, to help them get the multifamily going. And so we had done some multifamily deals uh, early on. And, you know, we both took on some. We even leased and managed some multifamily. And we did some student housing uh, as well. And then... You know, it, from a standpoint of timing, I joined in 04, then around, you know, 06, 07, uh, you know, I got the opportunity because John Gray, who was here leading the multifamily, 
wanted to retire uh, in, in a set amount of time. Got it. And they gave me the opportunity after two years here. So I joined as a leasing agent, mm-hmm. you know, going back, just taking a step back in 2004. And I leased the building across the street, which was a Class C office building, um, and the building that actually housed Dean and DeLuca. And uh, so I did started out there. And then two years later, I got this opportunity um, that John Gray and Daryl came to me and said, do you want to move over to multifamily with a goal that you would eventually take the multifamily side of our business and run it? Wow. And uh, so I had the decision to make. Do I leave the commercial side and move over to multifamily? And uh, I uh, took the opportunity <laughs> sure. and uh, got to learn a lot from John Gray, uh, who he had been at Summit and a lot of other places mm-hmm. in his career uh, and just was a wealth of knowledge and a great guy, another another mentor that, that helped teach me the multifamily business. And there, what was their plan or what was the opportunity laid out for multifamily? Was it, we're going to continue to develop uh, multifamily in a lot of different markets? Is it to also grow the management side, property management of it? Like what was the core, I guess, focal point of, hey, you're going to be stepping into this job, Steve. Here's what you're going to be in control of or responsible for. Yeah. It, one of the nice things uh, that, that Daryl and, and Jim have done in the past is, uh, you know, they, they have a strategic vision of where they want to go, but they also bring people into the roles and want to make sure that the vision is shared collectively. Okay. And so they also leaned on me and what did I want to do with it? What did I want to do with my career and mesh it together and then create a vision together? And so the plan was to continue to, you know, at that time we, uh, we were not, um, our volume was not high. It mm-hmm. was, we were very selective. We did great deals. We did a few. Um, we had a few clients, you know, we did two student housing deals with Johnson and Wales and we, you know, obviously we've done some condos and then we also looked at acquisitions. Um, but it, it was, it, it was more on the smaller scale. It wasn't necessarily to, to grow it, um, at that time. But that was what the goal was for me, was to take it over and to let's grow that uh, business line and turn it into something special. So what was the evolution from this 2005 of you're excited in this new residential role? And then obviously we have you know financial crisis coming up. So how does the company build? And you also said the company was a lot different then than it is now. So how did focusing on residential shape the company and maybe bringing it to more modern days. So how did you guys evolve over time? And were there any big key projects along the way that bolstered the company or you think defined it or, or really built the portfolio over time? It's a good question. Let's see how it articulates. There's articulate. a couple of them, uh, them the, in the, there. Yeah. Uh, I guess what I would say is, you know, one of the main reasons of getting into the multifamily was uh, to diversify mm-hmm. our product type. You know, we, we're experts on mixed use and office and have been since 1982. Um, but looking at it and trying to uh, run the business, you know, where, I mean, we're in, a, you know, real estate is very cyclical. And so trying to be smart about both, you know, having reoccurring fees um, as well as looking at different product types and, you know, when's the right time to develop and own um, each one. So it was a decision to uh, diversify our product. So, so from that standpoint, it was that's why we want to do it. And we mm-hmm. thought there was a great opportunity. You know, when we looked, this was back, you know, we really kicked things off after the GFC. Okay. You know, when okay. we, uh, you know, from a standpoint of really our ramping up our development, um, just looking ahead with both demographic trends and the need for housing, it was a, there's a long runway here. So it's it's a business we want to be in, you know, for the next several decades. And so we put the pieces in place to try to do that. And and but at the same time, continuing to do what we do well on the commercial side. So I guess coming out of trying to bring it back to your question, uh, you know, during the GFC, you know, not a lot was going on. Yeah. Uh, we did win an assignment with B of A to create a parking deck. Oh, uh, nice. we, we developed a large parking deck. Uh, and for them that helped us get through the fee GFC income. Yeah. fee income. And so then 2010 uh, sort of comes around and we're really trying to crank up the multifamily side. Uh, the multifamily team uh, consisted of myself. Um, and, and so I was out trying to find uh, sites. Mm-hmm. And, and so the very first deal, 2010, uh, Madison Square up near North Lake Mall. And so I'd say that, uh, from a deal stamp, help kick off sort of the last decade of what we've done on the multifamily side. Wow. And it was uh, it was tough going to find equity to help us kick it off. Uh, just because this was coming out of GFC, there was not a lot of lenders, there was not a lot of JV equity. Mm-hmm. 
and uh, it, it was it, it was hard, but it was a good site. Uh, it was the good old days. The overall basis was ninety three thousand five hundred dollars a door, um, and we had underwritten the dollar square foot in rents. And that same product today is two fifty a door. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so yeah, so that kicked us off. I definitely can tell some stories on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Let's hang out there for a minute. So, how do you find that site? And then, if you want to go into the probably the beat in the doors of the equity raising for that deal too, what was the I guess end to end the evolution of that project? So, uh, finding the site, we uh, through different relationships found a great land broker uh, at the time, and you know, with his help, we looked at a lot of sites, and uh, we found this one. It was across from the mall. You know, we liked the. Uh, proximity to the retail, and uh, that that sort of helped us key in on that. It was a pretty large site, and so we were able to do, you know, three, four, um, sorry, three story, four and four yep. story split apartment buildings, and keep the bases pretty low because uh, a dollar a square foot in rent in the suburbs uh, back then was actually a lot. Wow! And there was one comp uh, that was Wood Partners had done that was getting it, and so. Uh, so yeah, we were pushing the boundaries at the time. Interesting. And so we had probably talked to 60 different equity groups uh, and, you know, we had mass sort of send it out and to try to get someone interested. We had one group that took it all the way to investment committee. Uh, it was a large group, I won't say a name, mm-hmm. and uh, got turned down in investment committee because they wanted more urban infill, you know, they to get it through. They wanted more of a brochure deal. This was a suburban a low basis play yeah. that everybody wants now. Uh-huh. Uh, and But we found a group, uh, Assurant, out of New York that teamed up with us and uh, we were able to move forward and and kick it off. But one of the unique things with it, uh, a couple of unique stories with this uh, deal, uh, besides the first one coming out of, after the GFC, a uh, large site with a, a landowner, that a family that had owned it for years. Uh, but at the time, it only had one means of you know, ingress and um, egress, and it was because there was a spite strip. Um, so uh, originally, when the mall was developed and another and retail parcels, there, there was an argument on where to put the road. Mm. And so the developer at the time, Henry Faison, um, who's an industry icon or was, and uh, you know at the time uh, did not agree with the landowners. <laughs> And came up with this spite strip. So between the road and this property, there was a tenth of an acre that you had to have to have another access point to the wow. site. And so thankfully, we, uh, Daryl Dewberry, our my business partner, had a great relationship with Henry mm-hmm. and met Henry. And we were able to negotiate a deal to buy the spite strip so that we then could pull it together and create a great project. Um, and so it, it worked out without that. Uh, the project wouldn't wouldn't have really worked wow. in our mind, and so uh, yeah, we ended up paying quite a bit for that tenth I of an acre, uh, but it was well worth it. And uh, project turned out to be great. Uh, we you know, built it, great product, sold it to a great buyer, and I think three or four different groups have owned it, and uh, it's been a successful project. Were, you, you said you pitched 60 different uh, equity partners. What, what was the amount you guys were looking to raise, to roughly, if you remember? I mean, I mean, this was back when uh, it didn't cost, you know, the basis yeah. was much smaller. So if I, I don't remember the exact number, but let's say it was, I mean, it was probably still only like $15 million. So it wasn't okay. a large, in today's world, it wasn't, sure. it wasn't a large ask. And then did you have a, did you have debt lined up the whole time too? Because like, that was obviously hard to get. It was no, we were a parallel path. Okay, um, and so we were. Th- it was we were able to get the debt actually at that time slightly easier than the equity. Um, we weren't asking. You know, we're not. We tend to not go high leverage. Mm-hmm. You know, we're you're typically back in the day. You know, call it sixty sixty five. Okay. Um, you know, we never really got up to the a bunch of deals in the seventy five to eighty. That just yeah. isn't our business plan. Yeah. Uh, so we come out of this deal. How long did you guys own that? And then you said you you had sold it. Yeah, so we, years after? I mean, a lot of the first deals, we ended up getting into stabilization and then we'd sell them. Cool. They were more merchant build strategy, yep. you know, and we, you know, had that one, then we kicked off, you know, the next one was quickly Taliesin Road down um, on Daniel Island, down in Charleston. Oh, wow. Um, and then, you know, continued to build on that and, and subsequently you know, did, you know, call it 5,500 units over the last decade. 
So then your role obviously kind of keeps evolving over time too. So from VP, and I, I could be getting this wrong, but uh, VP, partner, president, COO, and then now CEO. So what is your personal kind of development or how is the business changing? And then maybe how is your partnership with, with Daryl changing al along the way as well? I'm sure that's evolving too. Yeah. So, you know, it, really starting with the multifamily. So I moved over to the multifamily yeah. um, after being here for a couple of years. Learned from John Gray. John Gray did retire, and I took over the uh, multifamily side of the business mm -hmm. and uh, continued to try to grow that. And then we needed to put in place um, a succession plan, you know, with Jim Doolin um, mm -hmm. at, at that time, who was chairman, uh, and Daryl was CEO, you know, and then I was running the multifamily, um, and we had other leaders, you know, running different divisions. And so we needed to put a plan in place. And so, you know, that was really the next step in working with Jim. And what he also wanted to see is the future of the company, working with Daryl on what he wanted to see as the future and then and where I fit. And so we, I moved into, we came up with a plan, agreed on, to, agreed on it, and I moved into the COO role. Mm -hmm. And we put in a, in a plan in place to buy Jim out. And so uh, ended up, you know, that was sort of the next shift. And then I got the opportunity to see operations across all divisions, uh, both everything from the team member side to the financial side and working with our CFO and you know, the whole team. And so that was really the next step of moving from just running the multifamily to running the company on more a day-to-day -day operations level. And then you know I did that for a few years mm -hmm. and, and we ended up buying Jim out and then Daryl and I... Uh, talked about sort of plans to take the next step for me to CEO and he was chairman and CEO and mm -hmm. it was just, it was the next uh, step in my growth. Uh, you know, from a day to day standpoint, you know, I it didn't change a whole lot, mm -hmm. uh, but it did from a standpoint of just, you know, looking, moving more towards uh, what I spent my time on from a both strategic relationship, external um, type role and, also getting better at uh, delegating to team members, yeah. and uh, which is always hard, uh, you know, probably one of the harder lessons as people move into different leadership roles. Uh, it's always easier to just do it yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but that's For a little bit of time. For a little yeah. bit of time. Yeah. Uh, you can't scale when you do that. What, what did you think helped that or helped you learn how to delegate better, like over time? Like what, what made you able to do it or... or how did you maybe learn the hard way in, in not delegating? Because it is a big lesson to learn. I would surmise it evolving from your career path. Yeah, it, it's uh, constant reminders. Uh, <laughs> and uh, from from Daryl, from uh, just other uh, mentors and team members, you know, just even here in, you know, from that I need to if we want to scale and reach the goals that we have. And also... You know, putting it in the context of probably, uh, from my standpoint, one of my largest uh, responsibilities is helping team members grow mm -hmm. and reach their goals. You know, I think as you get to the CEO uh, level, you know, so you're, you're, you're out of the actual, to a certain degree, deal making. You know, I'm not out looking at sites. I'm not, you know, meeting with the architects on design. Um, you know, I'm focused on helping on that, both the capital side and debt relationships, but also just the people growth. You know, it's, you get to this and you're, you know, I want to make sure I have the right people in the right places. Mm -hmm. And then I'm giving them the opportunity and the right amount of, uh, freedom to do their jobs and to grow, try things, fail, um, and, and grow. And a lot of times, you know, the, you can't do that if you're not delegating and letting, you can't micromanage. Um, and it is hard, you know, when you're in a business that we're in, that there's so much details about each deal and, mm -hmm. you know, and some it, it doesn't always work in every shop. You know, some, some uh, individuals that sit in my seat, you know, they want to pick the paint colors uh, in the units or, or that, and they want to get into it more. I'm more of the, let's find the right people you know, because so much uh, the fun part of what we do is what you get to create and you get to see it at the end. And, you know, and team members want to be able to see that, too, mm -hmm. and, and be able to look at their kids and say, yeah, I, I, 
I, I built that and I picked all that out, you know, cool. it, it's, and so there's a great story to it. Um, so I just through the years, you know, maybe refocusing what my, uh, real role and goals are mm-hmm. has helped realize that I need to do a better job of that. That makes sense. Two, two part question here, kind of picking on that last part, in a couple different ways. You mentioned it a couple of times, finding the right people or putting the right people in a spot where they can be successful. How do you do that? Very broad question, but what to you, how do you find the right people that are a good fit for the company or a good fit maybe for their role or the, the asset class they're working on? Kind of part one. And the second part, as you evolve into a more operational or seeing everything, how have you guys been able to be successful across multiple different asset classes? I think that's obviously remarkable to do. And a lot of shops will just stay on one asset class. Um, so kind of how do, how do both of those run hand in hand, I guess? Well, finding the right people uh, for the right spots is the mm-hmm. hardest thing any business owner or business leader uh, has to do. Um, I mean, it, this is I mean, all business and generally it's people business. And and so, uh, you know, it's relationships. It's being patient. You know, we're I much prefer finding people through relationships we have um, or if it's a relationship I've had for a long time. Uh, it's just you get a better feel mm-hmm. for a cultural fit. I mean, culture yeah, it's it's a buzzword everybody likes to talk about. Uh, everybody wants says they have great culture, of course, and yeah. uh, I mean it's so we say that too. Uh, <laughs> but I, I like to believe that you know we try to live it as well, and you know we're you know from our end whether it's you know it's you know our families and and interacting, doing things together, and you know creating that kind of atmosphere here uh, is what we try to do. But it's spending the time and being patient. And finding the right people, and uh, I'd say we, you know, and, and this a great example of this is sort of how we went into Florida uh, on the multifamily side. You know, a lot of uh, a lot of groups will say, "All right, we want to grow, and let's go hire uh, an agency to go find us a person to go plug in this market." You know, I'd rather find the person that fits the culture and fits who we are, and then let's go figure out how he can help the company grow, and so. Uh, our, you know, we hired, you know, Craig Miller, uh, who joined our firm and, you know, he helped kick off, uh, our Florida multifamily group and now runs a multifamily group. Uh, but, you know, I'd known him for a long time and I knew he'd be a great fit. And we talked and said, Hey, is now the right time? And I said, well, what do you think about Florida? <laughs> and, uh, it's, uh, it's worked out great. That's awesome. Um, before transitioning okay. to some deal stories, do you want to talk about the Spectrum Opportunity Funds? I didn't get much info on the website, but would love to hear kind of what made it the right time for you guys to introduce a fund. Like, who was the target market? Like, what was the um, what was the focal point or goal in, in bringing a, a, a fund to market? And maybe talk about fund structure too, if you want to. Yeah. So uh, one thing Spectrum's done since 1982 um, is you know, sort of strategic planning okay. and. Uh, you know, it's called it once a year, get together as a group and uh, put together a strategic plan, you know, looking both the next year, but also kind of think next three, five years. And you know, a lot of times we go out of town, do different things, uh, but it's been a consistent uh, thing we do. And so for years, you know, call it uh, 2014, 15 we talked a lot about, do we want to get into the fund business, you know, and, and mainly from a standpoint of having some more capital so that we could scale and do more deals. And so we talked about it at a bunch of our different strategic planning meetings. And, you know, we talked about it for a few years. And then finally, you know, 2016, uh, we decided to, you know, kick it off and we did our first fund. And uh, what we wanted to do is, you know, it's really, these are GP funds, mm-hmm. so they would help cover sponsor equity so that we could do more deals and uh, both grow our footprint and just deal flow. And so we kicked it off. Uh, first fund, we raised just north of $20 million. Um, you know, we, the goal was to do something that was manageable, that, that we <laughs> sure. felt we could deploy and, and deploy well. You know, we're, it's, you may ask it sometime, what do we try to do from a deal strategy, we, we would like our reputation to be, you know, we may not do the most deals, you know, we're not a volume player, mm-hmm. but we do high quality, solid deals. And we really focus hard on that. And we're probably more selective than most. Right. Um, and so 
But by setting this fund up, so a little over $20 million, and we deployed it, uh, we had the flexibility of both you know, office and multifamily, acquisition or development. And uh, we, you know, we were able to deploy it, put it out, and we've uh, round-tripped it all. Um, and so it was success, you know, beat our uh, expectations and what we had uh, shared with the investors were the goals. Uh, and so then we raised the second fund, um, sort of following that, uh, in 2018, 19. Okay. Um, and just north of $40 million. Um, it was also a, a GP fund. And, uh, and so we've uh, had that one. We've, we didn't end up deploying all of it. Um, we did finish our period of uh, investment period. Uh, but we just, over the last two years, I'm sure we'll talk about this, uh, the opportunities just haven't been there. And right. we've been selective, and so we did not fully deploy the fund because we just didn't find investments or development deals that we felt warranted it. And so we uh, we just told our investors we're going to stop here. Uh, we'll raise another fund when the time's right, mm -hmm. um, and we'll focus on executing the deals we have right now, and which is what we've been doing. Uh, digging into the deal strategy or architecture here. So you said you're selective and you, you, you're you not a volume shop, but find high quality deals. So how would you define your investment criteria or what makes something high quality? Is there any certain necessary metrics that you guys look for in a deal and structuring it or um, selective in um, maybe market? Like what, what, to, what to you makes the, uh, the deals that you guys do selective or high quality? Um, in positioning to them to investors, so to speak. Yeah, I, th I think it's uh, you're both look. It's a combination of things. Uh, you know, I'd say location, uh, design that we do with them. We spend some time with you know finding the right architect, the right interiors. You know, it's great real estate uh, that's built well in a good location uh, tends to outperform. And so, you know, even when you're doing suburban, you know, there are a locations and C locations. And so I think the team does a great job of finding the A locations. Um, even if it takes a little bit more work, you know, with the land seller, or if we have to get in, you know, there were times during this last cycle, you know, we had to get into a, you know, uh, RFP process where we're competing with a bunch of other developers. And, you know, we, uh, our team does a great job of working with land sellers mm -hmm. and also trying to figure out what the land sellers want to get out. A lot of these, a lot of the best land is owned by families and they've owned it for years. Yeah. And so uh, having a team that can go in, meet the family, work with the family, find out what's important to them, and then build a project that makes both parties proud uh, is, is something that we do that I think is a little unique um, in, in that we come in and can do that and are willing to be patient and work with those land sellers. Wow. Um, and so it, there's quite a few deals we've had that have been like that. Uh, we've also done three deals with a master um, uh, master developer that has done some large. I mean, it used to be Newland, now it's Brookfield. You know, we we bought three sites, and but after the first one, they saw our process and how we worked with them and what we delivered, and uh, it helped with the subsequent two. Um, so I mean, we're we are growing. You know, when I say not, it, we're definitely not just a volume shop. But the great thing is we found some great people in, in the multifamily platform, you know, in the Southeast. Like I said, we moved to Florida. Um, we're going to, you know, continue to grow in the Southeast. Um, so. Fair enough. What do you think in looking back before we get to maybe the, the vantage time frame here? What do, what do you think in building the business, especially residential, um, were the biggest challenges maybe for the company or for you in, in growing? Um and being a leader, what do you think were the biggest challenges for the business overall through those times? Well, we've had a, a cyclical nature, you know, the GFC, uh, <laughs> COVID. Uh, those, I would say, you know, we were really uh, ramping up and right before COVID. Mm -hmm. And obviously things were selling, cap rates were low, um, you know, and, and then we kind of went to COVID and it was a little bit of a what's going to happen. And actually... Right you know, ended up cap rates went down. Yeah. Uh, but, it, you know, from that standpoint, um, I'd say just challenge wise is, is, as we've already said, finding the right people. Mm -hmm. um, and then also uh, walking the fine line of staffing up to grow your pipeline, 
um, but then also knowing we're in a cyclical business and there's going to be a down period. And so it's just managing that well because we, we like to uh, have a solid team, but we also like to structure the business that uh, when times are tough, you know, we figure out what we sort of ride through it and then we can take better, we can take more advantage of the upswing. And so it's just, it's just been tough balancing that because um, you, you want to do deals uh, and, and grow and, you know, great developers are, are deal guys and they want to do deals. And so trying to allow them to do that, but also manage the business so that uh, we all know it's cyclical when things go uh, the wrong direction, sure. you're just in a good spot to uh, to ride it out. Speaking, okay, transitioning to COVID, do you, we can talk about a couple deals here. Do you want to talk about Vantage? Before we got started, you talked about this condo conversion across the street. Uh, and for those in the room, which which building is this here? It's 230 South Trine is across the street. So we're in 300 South Trine, right. uh, the Bearings uh, Tower in downtown Charlotte, which we developed. Uh, and then subsequently moved into as well for our yeah. offices. But then across the street is a condo building that used to be a Class C office building that we uh, redeveloped into condos. And uh, why, don't we, why don't we start there? Because I think we do it. It's yeah. a it's a good story. Uh, so you know, call it 2006, yeah. and it was a Class C office building. My first assignment um, as a Spectrum team member mm -hmm. to lease it, and uh, leasing was not going very well. <laughs> Our and partner, did you guys own the building? We did not. Okay. So Cornerstone, uh, which is now Bearings, Got which it. is part of Mass Mutual, mm -hmm. uh, had owned it for years. Wow. And so we were trying to lease it. We were trying to, you know, it's now Wells Fargo. Uh, had The bank had a branch, or not a branch, but a lot of office space in there. We were talking about doing different renewals. It didn't work. And then actually credit goes to a team member at Cornerstone. He just said, what if we look at a different use? And so then we spent time with them looking at different uses, and we came around and said, well, we could convert it to condos because the bay depths worked, the ceiling heights worked, uh, just the overall construction of it um, allowed us to be able to do that. You know, we did inset balconies, so just everything worked. It was it was kind of a perfect storm, if you will, because uh, it's very hard to convert an office building to multifamily. How many units is it now? How many residential condo so, units? It's 107 condo units. And then do you remember the additional construction cost? Because obviously the exterior is beautiful. It's built up. But like, do you, do you remember maybe what the additional construction cost per unit would have been? Of like, hey, we need to – just curious. I'm not asking an exact number, but was it significant or was it – it seemed like a, a reasonable amount to lay out? Because a lot of – you have a building that's existing and then you're putting out so much additional capital to convert it if – and still not know if it's going to sell too, which is – I don't, I don't remember the exact numbers. Yeah. Um, uh, what I do remember is just from a per unit. We, we bought the first unit, um, yeah. my wife and I, and we moved in. Uh, I remember, you know, the unit at the time was 360 grand. Yeah. Um, and so, and the profit margin uh, that we needed to make on it, I mean, we were, it was still like a call it a 20, 25% profit margin. So it ended up being a successful deal uh, for the team and it sold out quickly. Uh, one of the crazy stories with it, uh, we took it down to the steel and concrete, um, took the whole exterior off. Oh, wow. Uh, but we, there was one tenant in the building. Um, it was a uh, MCI switching station, so, and they had a long-term lease, and we could not force them out of the building. And so what we had to do was we built a shell around the space and uh, to develop the rest of the project while they were there. Wow. And so we had to, you know, everything from plywood to everything around it, and we had to keep power to it because it couldn't go down. And uh, so it, it made it a much more difficult development process, uh, but it, uh, it was successful. We made it through it, uh, a lot of stress. Uh, but we got through it. Um, so transitioning to Vantage, I went down this morning to check it out. It's an it, unbelievable two sets of buildings, right? So it's uh, two 11-story buildings, 630-ish thousand square feet um, on the south end. Seemed like it started in 2019, which was an interesting time period to obviously be developing, looking back, right? An mm -hmm. office deal. So what was the um, what was the evolution or story of that project? Because it seemed, in looking back through your remarks, a wildly successful project at that. Yeah, so the story goes back uh, quite a ways. Uh, we 
a local family um, that we've helped a lot with. Uh, we ended up developing South Trine Square office tower downtown that had been DeLuca. They sold it, call it 06, 07. And we t- helped them. They took those proceeds and they bought uh, some land in South End. Uh, they was, had an old law building and, you know, surface lot and some other, but they took some of that money and bought that. And, uh, so they, we helped them kind of find that. So they bought that. Then in 2018, uh, give or take, we were talking with them about what to do with their site, mm. which was in South End. And we looked next door, there was this old office building. And so we started talking with the owners and, to long story short, ended up buying that office building and that site, which was adjacent to this family's site. And we combined them, brought them into the partnership with us. Oh, wow. And that created the five acres per vantage. Wow. And so it's, uh, it's been a lot of uh, years sort of in the making. And so we ended up buying it, uh, combining it, and rezoning it. Okay. And so that was a process working with the city uh, and, and other constituencies in South End and successfully got that rezoned and then teamed up with Invesco uh, to go through it. And we had a lot of different iterations on the project. You know, it started out at one time, it was eight stories uh, for each of the two buildings, then nine, you know, then 10, we were talking, we needed to get pre-leasing. So, I mean, we were pitching, you know, everybody from Lowe's, you know, to Honeywell, to a lot of, you know, large tenants coming in. So Uh we went through a lot of different iterations. Uh, but we ended up landing on 11 stories uh, for each of the two towers. Uh, but what we what we did, one of the interesting things is at the time we went out to get construction financing, and but we ended up getting a facility. It ended up being three banks uh, that would be that would for the total amount of the project for both towers. Wow! Uh, and so we had the flexibility, uh, which you know, we'll, as we move through the process was extremely important to control when the second tower was kicked off. So majority of the first building was equity Mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, some debt, but then we controlled the second tower. And so with Invesco, uh, we had a pre-lease, but we signed Lending Tree. So they were our anchor tenant, kicked off the first building. And we looked at a lot of scenarios of, do you build the first building with the whole deck, half the deck, you know, a lot of different. Uh, scenarios, but we ended up building, kicking off the first tower and the parking deck uh, with flexibility on what to do with phase two. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well underway. It's going well. Uh, COVID happens, uh, March of 2020. And uh, we had planned, our goal was in different timing to kick off the second tower, summer of 2020. And so as we're looking at things, we haven't signed another lease yet in the first tower. Uh, but working with Invesco and our team, we uh, collectively decided uh, let's move forward wow. and uh, deliver the building. So we we started it summer of 2020 without any pre-leasing, and uh, and then the dominoes started to fall. And we, you know, Grant Thornton signed up, and the West Tower, which was the one with the Linden Tree, yep. kind of leased up, and then we were able to move over to the East Tower. Uh, which was the spec building, and we were able to lease it from the bottom floor to the top, which is very abnormal. Uh, normally, your your best space goes first, yeah. and uh, it was super successful. The team here, our leasing team, did an outstanding job, and the project itself, location, you know, it was one of those things that uh, I think our strategy and vision was great, mm-hmm. you know, but there's always some luck in your timing as well, and what we had put together was really a post COVID building before COVID existed right? Uh, with its outdoor space. You know, we had an acre park, you know, we, when we designed the building, we took five acres and a lot of developers would just maximize density mm-hmm. and just pack it all in. You know, we really wanted to create a sense of place. We wanted to create something special. And so that's why we had an acre for a park. You know, we just built two 11 story towers and a parking deck that we could put a hotel on top of, uh, but we didn't really maximize density. We wanted to create, uh, you know, what we thought was a unique, special project that was kind of the bridge between Uptown uh, and South End, and it was a we thought Carson Boulevard would turn into sort of, you know, call it Main and Main for Charlotte. Um, hindsight, it's generally played out that way, um, and so uh, we're excited how that's turned out. But 
but yeah, it, you know, leased up, uh, it's hundred percent leased now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's as office project goes, I mean, office is not, uh, everyone's top choice, but it's, uh, it's successful cash flow and great project. And we're glad to own it. Wow. I read somewhere, um, maybe it had to have been a somewhat recent article, but it said, I would love to, I don't know what we're going to what we're focused on next or next big deal, but I would like to do another project like Vantage. So what about that project would you like to do again? Another kind of just well drawn out um, office space downtown, re- revitalizing. What about something like that project would you want to do again? Well, I think that project and, and one of the neat things of about being a developer yeah. uh, is, you know, projects and things we work on can, can really change a community. And, you know, that project and what I think it did for South End, I mean, we were building on, you know, previous developers, you know, Beacon did a great job with Rail Yard mm-hmm. and, you know, Cousins did their project as well, you know, but by building sort of where we did, you know, a lot of people looked at us like, ah, I don't know if that's going to work right there on the edge, right. you know, but I do think it transformed that part of town and has really brought uptown and south end together. So having such a transformative project Got it. Uh, is one of the neat things about what we do. And that was definitely one of them. And, you know, and rethinking how just office is, is both developed and utilized. You know, mm-hmm. I think as a lot of tenants come out of COVID, you know, there's the conversation of, you know, back to work, work from home. You know, I think a lot of what we want to focus on is it's the space that you create that people both want to be there and are more productive there. So I think, you know, having the outdoor space, you know, I think having all the light that we created, having the retail amenities in the, in the bottom of it, um, just the layout, it's very efficient. Um, and just the amenities we, we've created everything from a real gym that you'd have to not, uh, not a small one you'd stick in the Mm -hmm. um, basement and just the overall feel of the project. We tried to take, what you could get in Silicon Valley and, you know, bring it to Charlotte. And, you know, we didn't want to go super tall, you know, not everybody wants to be on the 50th story. Sure. You know, it's, they want to be closer to the floor. They want to come down, get outside, have the interaction with others. And, you know, we think that's sort of uh, what people want. Um, and as well as, you know, it, it's not as, architecturally, you know, uh, pretty or looking at, but the ingress, egress, creating a project that has four ways in and out of the deck, um, and getting easy access because, you know, right now people want flexibility Mm -hmm. and they want to be able to, you know, work from home in the morning, but be able to come to work in the afternoon to meet with teammates Mm -hmm. and having, uh, easy access in and out on when you're talking about office space. And so we were able to create that there. So finding a project that, uh, can be transformative like that. That's kind of on the cutting edge of where we think uh, it's going is what we'd want. You know, and you'd say the same thing on the multi side uh, and finding great locations. You know, we're doing a, more of a low basis right now because there's a huge need for an affordability. Uh, there's a lot of people that can't afford just the, the high rises for the urban projects. And, and so we're out um, in all of our markets looking for opportunities to deliver uh, great high quality projects, but at a lower base. Reasonable. Uh, was the prospect, so the prospect is right down the road too mm-hmm. from Vantage. Was that before or after Vantage? You so, developed that project. So it was actually during. Oh, I mean, wow. we, kicked, we kicked that one off in also summer of 2020. So we'd kicked Vantage off first. Okay. Uh, but we felt that we were going to be adding a lot of value to the Carson. No kidding. Um, okay. uh, corridor. And so we went and assembled uh, a bunch of parcels of land there, put it together to then, and the reason only there was easier, uh, and pulled it together to kick that off. Uh, and then at the same time, we also bought uh, an office building uh, and renovated it also on Carson, um, uh, a block away from Vantage as well. Oh, wow. And uh, so that's been a success. Nice little corridor. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, any other projects you want to chat about this bearings building here? Yeah. In? Why don't I tell the story uh, of the tower that we're in? So uh, I guess they say third time's the charm. That's right. And uh, so uh, Spectrum has tried to uh, develop this three times. First time I was not here, it was going to be an office tower with one of the large banks uh, was going to be the anchor. And uh, half of the lease 
had been signed, and the leader of the bank that was going to sign it was flying in town to sign the lease and kick the building off. Uh, the Lear landed and decided that no, they were not going to sign the lease and they had a different strategy and a different building. And so that uh, time, obviously, uh, did not move forward. Mm-hmm. Second time I was here and we were going to build uh, a project. This was back in 07 uh, as the 300,000 square feet of uh, office space. And we were going to do a condo tower on top of it. Right, this right. was back when everyone was you know, doing this vertical uh, mixed use. And so we had gone out and I had sold 77 of the condo units. How many total were there? Uh, yeah, th- we were going to have 110 okay. units. And so, so we had big sold. Sale out. Oh, yeah. 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 Big. You know, we Collected had, deposits? Like pretty- we had deposits. Okay. Uh, and we had signed the uh, GMP contract with the GC and had started uh, demoing the uh, surface lot and the buildings that were on it. Wow. And then uh, I'm sitting in a design meeting with the architect uh, and Jim and Daryl, uh, February of 08, and we get a phone call from the CIO of our partner and says he's pulling the plug. He's worried about the banks. And so we uh, obviously uh, pulled the plug in the deal. We re uh, uh, did the surface lot back to parking spaces and return the deposits and killed the deal. So fast forward, uh, third time we ended up coming back and, uh, bearings was an anchor and we kicked it off and, you know, finished the project, uh, you know, 600,000 square foot, uh, office tower in downtown Charlotte. We finished it in 17 and, uh, it was. A, it's been a great success, uh, but yeah, there, it took three times to develop the tower. Uh, but at the uh, end of the day, it's great because this go around we also developed the Kempton Hotel in the back, oh, so it, we were able to. So it ended up being probably the better project of all the designs that we've done. Uh, but yeah, we we also built a 217 key Kempton on the back. Wow. In wrapping up a little bit, Steve. Um, we chatted about a lot of deal stories. What do you think you have any unique perspective on development that you think most folks don't, or is there anything that, that you think is critical to deal making in your eyes that you've always focused on throughout your career? Yeah, I, I mean, there are a lot of great developers. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I think a big thing for us, uh, you know, is first and foremost, you know, have a long term mindset, uh, even if we are going to sell a project and as a merchant build strategy. Having a long-term mindset um, it gets you thinking about decisions you make that are going to be best for the project long-term. Mm. And so I think going at it uh, both on a project standpoint, on a relationship standpoint, you know, uh, focusing on having a long-term relationship with ever, whichever investor you're doing, same with your lenders, you know, treating it with having a long-term mindset. And so, you know, all of, uh, I mean, most of our lenders we've done repeat business with. Uh, a lot, most of our investors we've done repeat business with. And so I think that, that, uh, you know, comes from having that focus and, and not necessarily having to win every point wherever it may be and playing the long game. Um, you know, and then it's, you know, then I would follow back with, uh, you know, you do business with people you like and, and I think, you know, as we, whether it's negotiating, you know, we try to do the right thing. And even if it's the hard thing mm-hmm. and in each of the situations that we're in. And I think with that focus, uh, you know, it helps us because this is very much a relationship business. And I mean, you, you build uh, great buildings and pretty buildings, but at the end of the day, it's the team you put together, whether it's the architect, the GC, you know, your investors, mm-hmm. it's all relationships and working together as a team and, uh, and trusting each other. I love it. Uh, in wrapping up to two part question here. So what, what is th- this market we're in right now is, is challenging, right? From a leasing perspective, maybe office related. Um, there's different multifamily challenges, obviously, as well, but then capital markets too, whether it's debt or equity. So what challenges is the team kind of experiencing now in regards to those? But more specifically, what is the team focused on now with those challenges I- existing rather? Yeah. <laughs> Forward looking. <laughs> it's a challenging time. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I'm excited about the future. 
You know, I think we've, our business, and I, I believe our industry and our business has been in a recession for the last two years. Um, our side of it, not yeah. everybody else. Right. Um, but what we're, I mean, it's just as tough, if not tougher in some ways than the GFC was for our business. Uh, however, you know, I, I think we're coming to the tail end of that. You know, I think both on the commercial side and multifamily side. So let's talk on the commercial side first. Mm-hmm. Uh, office uh, is not everybody's first choice no doubt. Uh, when you talk about it, where they want to put their investment dollars. Um, however, uh, high quality assets, you know, like Advantage mm-hmm. or like the Variance Building, um, are in high demand. I mean, we don't we don't have any space Advantage. If we did, we could charge a lot more in rent. I mean, <laughs> that there's there's a demand for it because, uh, I mean, office is still needed, and great office is needed. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think that you know the shift to uh, you know the flight to quality is a real thing, especially on the office side. And so uh, you know I'm I'm excited about as what we've learned over the last four or five years, you know, the new office that gets built is going to be so much better than what was mm-hmm. done in the past. And so I'm excited to see what we all do with that in the future. And I do think you're going to see more, you know, back to work, uh, you okay. know, pushes. I mean, you saw Amazon came out. Um, and so, but I, the good news is I think there it's going to be pushes to get back to work, but with flexibility. And I think that's great from the human side. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think getting people back in the office as well is great from a collaboration side because right. so much of what we do, whether it's the young generation learning and getting mentored, you know, being together in the office. So I do think there's going to be great opportunities um, on the commercial side, you know, for our team. Uh, Development is going to be really hard, you know, in the near term, and you know, finding the right value for older assets is mm-hmm. extremely hard. Yeah. So. so what do you think happens to all the older, outdated office space? I think a lot of, I mean, I think a lot of the older stuff gets torn down. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of space that, that that's the highest and best use. Right. Um, and, you know, and, I, and at the end of the day, you know, you then have to figure out what do you put back. And, you know, it's going to take some time, but, uh, you know, you, some great things will come from it. Mm-hmm. But I, I think a lot of it gets torn down. Um, some of it will Fair. be converted, but I would say less than 5%. Wow. Um, it's just it's just really hard to convert, uh, you know. But uh, we'll see. Mm-hmm. Um, on the multifamily side, uh, you know, we're very bullish on we're from a demographic standpoint, from a uh, where we are, our markets, on the need for more housing, and you know, it's uh, so the southeast kind of where we are, whether it's the Carolinas, Florida, we've done stuff in Nashville, you know, but just really the southeast. You know, we're out looking for deals. You know, most deals haven't penciled for the last two years, uh, but we're seeing construction costs come down. Uh, you know, hopefully debt costs are going to come down. With hopefully a rate cut this week, and it continues. But the, the metrics are getting better, um, and we're starting to move through the supply. You know, supply has you know been a, a large headwind on the multifamily side, um, and you know after the boom, you know we definitely have built a lot of apartment units. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we we needed a little bit of a pause mm-hmm. um, to slow in. I mean, new starts has dropped drastically, uh, which has been a good thing from a standpoint of just overall industry. And but yeah, uh, it's going to kick back into gear. I mean, the team's out looking for sites um, on the multifamily side, and we're starting to see more opportunities, uh, more interest on the equity side, uh, as well as lenders are back lending, which is exciting. Um, and so really a lot has changed in the last 60 to 90 days, I would say. Uh, it, a lot more green shoots. Yeah. Um, so, and we're looking to ramp up our multifamily uh, side and grow that platform in the southeast. And then on the commercial side, you know, we're also seeing, you know, pick up in leasing. And so we've, you know, got some different leasing assignments that uh, are, we're starting to see activity pick up. And so we're, we're also uh, hopeful there and to, you know, grow you know, in the immediate term, growth, leasing, management, mm-hmm. some different opportunities, uh, just while development's still pretty hard not to make the numbers work. But, uh, you know, we'll, it'll it'll come back. And uh, we are working on a large project with the city, which we're excited about, uh, which is a train station and gateway project, yeah. which, uh, which, which will be uh, both great for the city and great for us. That's awesome. Will you guys ever do any multifamily acquisition, do you think, or just purely focused on development from the ground up? 
Uh, no, we'd, we absolutely we're would We're still do. focused. Okay. Uh, we yeah. would definitely do acquisition. Yeah. Uh, just finding the right deal yeah. and hit, hit the right metrics that make sense for our investors and for us. And so we, we have not uh, found the right one uh, mm-hmm. for us. But no, I, I could see us as we grow the platform to both looking at buying and developing. You know, it's uh, right now there, there are some great opportunities to buy um, that are out there. And, and so having the capital and focus on that is, is definitely something we're talking about as awesome. we're looking at growing the platform. Uh, last two questions for you. So yeah. w- where do you see, and you kind of talked to, certainly talked about the future of the company there, but more specifically for you, is there any kind of development itch or, or business itch that you haven't scratched? Is there any asset class that you haven't been a part of or, or real estate related service? Or is there any market that the company hasn't been in that you would like to, to see the, the company do over time? So service, asset class, or market? Anything you guys haven't done that you would like to do at some point? Uh, I'd probably say more on the, the market side. I, one, I'd, I'd want to grow our capital management business. Okay. You know, I want to continue the fund to business. the yeah. fund business. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I think having access to capital um, is you know, always been important, but I think it's going to be even more critical as mm-hmm. we go forward. Uh, you know, coming out of this, you know, last part of the cycle. Uh, and then it's just from a market standpoint, you know, I want to continue to go deeper in the markets we have, but, but also expand to some other southeastern markets, you know, maybe eventually more long term, you know, getting over to a Texas market. Um, but, you know, that's more of a long term and there's a lot of players out there. So it, it, we'd have to have the right person um, to do that, but really go deeper and get back into Nashville. We've done a lot in the past. We don't have anything right now there. We think long term that'll be a good market. A lot of supply right now, but right. long term, and uh, you know, continue to just build great projects where we are, and and continue to I'd say build uh, larger teams in the individual markets, mm-hmm. so we can continue to have a large impact. Because a lot of what we do too is, you know, we want to make a positive impact on the communities, sort of where we develop, and and part of that is being plugged in, and not just the buildings themselves. Right. Well, in the fund business. Would it always be just equity focused or do you think there would be a, a debt fund or some sort of credit fund product at some point as well? It's a good question. Yeah. Uh, it's, just a question. Yeah. yeah it's, uh, I mean, it's something we, we talk about and yeah. I mean, right now we, it's, you know, kind of GP fund focused mm-hmm. um, and that's where you know, a lot of the relationships are and what we're focused on. I mean, long term, you know, do we expand that? You know, I'm, I'm not sure. It's yeah. something we'll probably, we'll at least take a look at. Um, but uh, but our main focus is you know we yeah, I think we do the things we have very well we have a great team yeah. and just to build on that and hire some more people mm-hmm. and and grow the platform. Last one along the way you've mentioned a handful of uh, iconic folks so far in the conversation and, and before too. Who do you think along the way has helped you the most in your career or building the business and in becoming a good leader? Who do you think has been impactful in your development life uh, as with uh, everybody quite a few people uh, right. it's, it's hard to pick one I, I I'd probably start with uh, help me out the most of my career uh, and support is probably my wife um, just it's so much of what you know we do uh, you know having the support um, both with uh, at, at home with the kids and uh, it's it's stressful what we do uh, as developers and in the industry, and so having that support at home and continuing to encourage. And uh, like I said, I started out in a leasing job where you know it was 100% commission, and so I uh, couldn't do that uh, without um, that support and without her. So I'd start there, and then you know from a you know work standpoint, giving me the opportunity uh, that Jim and Daryl did um, to come here. And then have the faith to give me a chance instead of hiring outside the company to come in and run the multifamily, which you know sort of just changed my career trajectory uh, when I moved from the office to the multifamily with a path to run that division. Uh, just set me on a path to where I am, and and just their confidence and trust uh, to let me learn a lot um, as a, a young kid. In, in, a, in a business uh, that has a lot of risk. Uh, and so uh, that faith in me, I'd say, you know, really helped kick it off. And then there's, 
you know, from John Gray teaching me the multifamily business to a lot of leaders in the community that I've gotten to spend time with, it's, uh, you know, it, it's hard to say one has been an outsized versus the other. It's just, I mean, the nice thing with our industry is, you know, whether it's NMHC, ULI, a lot of different avenues to meet, mm-hmm. you know, leaders that have done a lot in this industry. Yeah. And most of the time, I'd say 95% of people are open to having coffee, sit down, help, support, and which is which is great. And, you know, I, I try to, uh, you know, pay it forward as well and offer to do that for anyone and everyone. I love it. I think that's a, a great place to wrap up. Is there anything Spectrum related that we missed or that you wanted to, to, to wrap with in any way? No, I, I think that uh, you hit all of it. I mean, I, I would just end with that, uh, you know, I can sit here and share sort of my story, but uh, any CEO or owner story is, uh, you know, wouldn't be there without the team. Okay. And, you know, I wouldn't be sitting here talking. We wouldn't have the successes of the buildings without the, the team that does it. And, uh, which is so important. And I think we have the best team in the business and and I couldn't be more proud to just be on the team with them. And, uh, the journey has been fun and I look forward to, uh, the next 30 years. Absolutely. Steve, thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity. Yes, sir.